fix through the 10th essays in the Breaking Smart series, Software is Eating the World, he talks kind of more about how software affects entrepreneurs and, and really the rest of the world, um, just what it, what it looks like for them, how it changes what they're doing, what the, um, what the new ideas are. So a few of the things that he mentions are how software has basically zero cost. There's a lot of other professions and a lot of other substances that kind of cost a lot to make up front. But he talks about how software has almost no cost and it has a huge value in, in the world. So, so it, it's, got a, it's got a great um, price value with it. Uh, he also talks about how uh, a lot of things in software kind of start out as trivial uh, you know, no, don't mean quite as much, but those things often will become revolutionary ideas. Things that no one thought were going to be big uh, often really take off in in the software industry. Uh, and then he also talks about just the chaos in software now. Uh, he kind of talks about the shift of, of how that's happened, but how uh, just how so many people in, in the software industry, so much different software, the collaborations that have happened with it. Uh, so it's just kind of a chaotic world to be in. Um, he also talks about how software is many times kind of geared toward, you know, three years from now. You know, it's, it's based off of things that aren't necessarily happening yet, uh, but are soon to be happening, which kind of goes against a lot of rules of, you know, like of good business and like doing for the people who are there, but it's more doing it for the future. An example that he gives is when the original design of the Mosaic browser uh, was made, it kind of had this assumption that everyone would have high bandwidth access to the internet um, in the future. And that was something at the, at the time, it was not the case at all. But now it's it's something that is. And so they kind of built this based on uh, the assumption that that's what would be happening. Um, and that, I mean, like I said, it just kind of goes against all thinking. Even <laughs> even in our daily lives, you know, when we order something off Amazon, it's like, I have to get it in two days. It's like, you know, good grief. If it took, so, if it took seven days, like it used to, I mean, people would have a heart attack. You have to get it in two days. So this idea of designing software and then, you know, it's, it's not quite functional or it, it works best with things that haven't even been, you know, haven't even been used yet. It's, it's just kind of mind blowing, uh, the possibilities that are there and, uh, how much it kind of goes against, um, what a lot of people might do in other professions. Um, so then uh, the the last three things I had were all taken from the 10th essay. Uh, some really good stuff in that one. One of them was a quote, or I guess kind of a saying, uh, and that is, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And I think you see this anytime you're on the edge, you're kind of on the cutting edge of change, of of, of the new things that are happening. You're going to have so many people because because people pretend to think pretend, pretend to say that they you know they like change or they like trying new things, but in reality, everyone almost everyone fights against change. They like being where they are, and so when you're on that that cutting edge development of the change that's happening, people like I said, they're going to ignore you. They're gonna they're gonna make fun of you. They're gonna fight against you, but eventually. I mean, just like the seasons happen every single, every single year, every single year there's change. And, and if you adapt to that change, then you're going to be the one that, you know, in the end has won. Um, the other thing was, and I, I'm still kind of wrapping my, my mind around this one, but he talks about how if you were in 1990 or 2000, I'm, I'm too young, I guess, to, to remember what it, what it was like with those, uh, those years with cell phones and, and cars. Uh, but let's say 1995. 1995 cars were kind of like the the main thing everyone had a car you know going to work maybe not everyone but um it, it was basically kind of this necessary thing of okay yeah you have your car to get to, to and to and from work and uh and then cell phones were invented and they were kind of the accessories they weren't really necessary but you know they were nice to have and being able to contact people but with the software uh that has changed and, and made the ability for smartphones to, to be invented. And now you've got all this ride sharing stuff with Uber and Lyft. Those roles have kind of reversed where now it's like, you need the phone, you need the smartphone, but the car isn't actually really as necessary because you can, you know, you can get these, these ride, sh ride sharing services. Um, and so just kind of the shift that's happened so fast. I mean, cars aren't that old of a technology as, as technologies go over the space, the, the series of the world, 
Um, but yet it, it, this, it's changing so fast that so rapidly that now phones are basically, you know, the, the necessary thing and cars are more the accessories to it. And then the very last thing, uh, was just a quote they have by Tim O'Reilly that's create more value than you capture. And this once again, just reminds me of the Praxis mindset. It's the apprenticeship program that I'm in right now of, of making sure that everything you're doing, you're seeking to create more value. And I look at this even in the, in the eyes of looking at the world where you're not just looking at kind of for myself, what can I do for myself, just getting through every day, however I can, but you're looking at what value can I create? How can I make sure that my life is producing more than it's taking? And I just love this mindset. I think it's such a healthy thing for all of us, all of us to think about as much as we can.